But it's good to see everybody here today. Appreciate your presence. If we have any visitors, I encourage you to uh, let us know if you have any questions of a spiritual nature or if you'd like to know more about our congregation. We'd love to sit down and open up our Bibles together and, and study with you. So at this time, let's have our Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 3. There's a reference there that I'd like to make as we get into our first lesson this morning. In 1 Peter chapter 3, let's begin in verse 13. And who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing in which you're slander, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. We always have to have an answer for the things that we believe. If we're going to believe in them, then we must be ready to defend them. One of the difficulties that we have in presenting the gospel to people is getting past that point of discomfort. When you meet somebody who is religious or shares uh, some background with you in some sense, or somebody who shares at least some basic understanding of Christianity, it's easy for us to find that common ground and kind of leave it at that. Of meeting a co-worker who is a believer, say, oh, you believe? Well, so do I. I believe in Jesus. I've, uh, I've been a Christian for this many years. How about you? And, and you almost get to that point in the conversation where you know the next thing that you say is going to make them uncomfortable you know the next thing you need to say, you should say, is going to make them uncomfortable. And it's just easier to stay at that point of, we've got a few things in common, so let's just be satisfied with that. And more often than not, at least when I'm talking to religious friends, uh, uh, denominational friends, uh, more often than not, it's baptism that ends up being one of the things that's a sticking point between us where we have a lot of things in common and we believe a lot of the same things and we acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but at what point we've become a Christian and, and what's the role of baptism, that becomes a very difficult thing. So I have been working on for myself, and I certainly hope it's something that you can appreciate or something that you're willing to work on as well. I have been working on being more direct with people. Just getting to the point, instead of just reaching that comfortable point of similarities, I'm trying to push past that point and really live this 1 Peter 3 passage and being willing to say something that's going to put me at odds with a lot of the people around me, but that needs to be said, and then being willing to defend that. So that's how this lesson was born. I am going to start asking people directly, have you been baptized? So not only do I want to know, have you been baptized, but for what reason were you baptized? And in what way were you baptized? And when were you baptized? Because those questions are essential. Not every baptism is the same baptism. As we read in Ephesians chapter 4, there is but one baptism, just as surely as there is one Lord and one faith and one hope of your calling, there is only one baptism that actually means something when it comes to salvation. And calling something baptism or believing that something is baptism simply because you've experienced or it felt good or it was part of a tradition in your background, that is not necessarily the same thing as being baptized. So as I said, in our conversations with religious friends and acquaintances, it really doesn't take long for baptism to come up if we're willing to go that direction. And more often than not, it is accompanied by some awkwardness over the fact that baptism can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people depending on your background. So does it really matter how you're baptized and why you're baptized and when you're baptized? Are all supposed baptisms equal, and do they accomplish the same thing, if you even believe they accomplish anything at all? So let's start with the how of baptism, and I want to keep this very straightforward. This is not going to be a long lesson, and I hope that you're willing and able to put some notes together, and maybe you can use this same lesson in a Bible study with somebody. I imagine if you went through it pretty quickly, it might take 15 or 20 minutes just to present these basic concepts of baptism. 
But as I'm often told, sometimes it's important just to go back to the basics and make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to an essential topic like this. So how is one baptized? There is a consistency that you should notice as you study the book of Acts, as you study the New Testament in general, there's a consistency to how people are baptized. New Testament baptism always consistently as a command or as an example in the New Testament, indicates that there is consent in it, that there's agency, that when you see people being baptized and all of the language associated with commands with baptism, like in Mark 16, verse 16, or in Matthew 28, or in Acts 2, verse 38, or Acts 22, verse 16, there's always agency involved in that. That when you're baptized, you've chosen to be baptized. That you know you're being baptized. And you know why you're being baptized, though. We'll save the why here for just a minute. It's always in water. Water is always associated with it. You're not baptized in dirt. Jesus was baptized in a tomb. We're not baptized in a tomb. We're not baptized in dirt. We're not baptized into the ground. We're not just baptized in a, in a big blanket either. We're baptized in water. And it's always full immersion because that's what the word means. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment also. And it's always viewed consistently as a necessary part of salvation. As you read here in Mark 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. Or in Matthew 28, verse 19, in the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all the nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That that's how you make disciples. And if there is no baptism, you haven't made a disciple of Christ. <coughs> Making disciples and baptism are linked in Matthew 28, 19. Or in Acts chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, as the evangelist is preaching, people believe, and what is the natural response of their belief? What is the next thing that people do after believing the message? They're baptized. And the Ethiopian eunuch, later on in the chapter as well, he's presented with the gospel message, and he asks the question, what prevents me from being baptized? Well, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, then I guess nothing prevents you from being baptized except for access to water. And lo and behold, when somebody needs water to be baptized, there just happens to be water there. And that's a great point there, by the way. When we look in Acts chapter 8 in the Ethiopian eunuch, when somebody wanted to be baptized, was it impossible for that person to be baptized? All of the hypothetical situations that people come up with, I just don't, I don't see how they play out in real life. What if someone wants to get baptized and they die in a car accident on the way to the church building? You know, it's like, does, does that actually ever happen? I want, when people come up with hypotheticals like that, I want to know, like, oh, tell me when that happened. Show me, the, show me the newspaper clipping of when that actually happened. Bring me the link to the article online of when that actually happened, please. All right, when someone wanted to be baptized and there literally was no water to baptize them or they died on the way to get baptized or an icicle fell and impaled them as soon as they wanted to get baptized, show me that article of when that actually happened to somebody. No, when somebody wants to be saved, does God make the way possible for that person to be saved? Even on a desert road, where the Ethiopian eunuch was in his chariot. Of all the places where it might be most inconvenient to be baptized, there he was on a desert road. And when he wanted to be baptized, look, there is water in his own words. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, as the Apostle Paul recalls his own conversion story, he remembers what's told him. Why do you delay? I've always liked that, by the way. And that's a, that's a when element, right? That's a time element there. Why do you delay? Arise and be baptized. Call on the Lord and have your sins washed away. That's an important thing to remember there. And every example that we see in the book of Acts, of Lydia, for example, and the Philippian jailer, of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and the Corinthians in chapter 18, I mean, you see this over and over and over again. There's example after example after example of baptism that we see, and they're always consistent examples that give us the same 
presentation of baptism. The word baptism itself literally means to bury or immerse. And that's not the same thing as sprinkling. And that's not the same thing as pouring. And that's not the same thing as just something that's merely theoretical or I was baptized in my spirit. No, to be literally immersed. And the word, by the way, includes the entire process. It's not just the process of dunking something. The word baptism in the Greek literally means to include every part of the process. To take something, to bury it, to immerse it fully, to keep it under for a time, and then to pull it back out. In fact, the word is often used, in the first century at least, in secular language, of dyeing fabrics. And if you want to dye a piece of fabric, you don't put it halfway in the water and you don't sprinkle it with the dye, and you don't pour the dye across the top. You take the piece of fabric and you fully immerse it. It is submerged in the dyeing agent, and it stays there until it's fully soaked, then you pull it back out completely. That's the process of baptism. Just like you would dye a garment, that's the process we must undergo in baptism. That is biblical baptism, and anything that's not that is not biblical baptism. So why are there so many different baptisms out there? Why are there so many different ways that people can get baptized in various different religious traditions? Well, remember according to Ephesians 4 verse 5, there is only one baptism. Just as surely as there is one Lord and one faith and one hope of your calling, there is one baptism that means something. I think that's the way we understand that, right? There's only one baptism that means something, only one baptism that does something, only one baptism that's effective in bringing salvation to a person. And calling something baptism, while it's fundamentally different from the baptism of the Bible, to me just creates a misnomer. It just creates a misnomer where you're calling something baptism that isn't baptism. By definition, it isn't baptism. So why? That's the next question that people have. Why are there so many different methods and means of baptism in various religious traditions out there? And there's a number of explanations that we don't have time to get into, but in short, I would say one of them is tradition. That if your church or your denomination or, or, or your religious background, whatever it is, has always baptized someone in a certain way, babies by sprinkling, whatever, that's just the tradition, and we've always accepted it, we've come to acknowledge it, and that's how it is, and that's how my parents were baptized, and that's how my grandparents were baptized, and that's how we've been doing it for a thousand years now. But just because you've been doing it for a thousand years doesn't make it biblical baptism. It simply is a tradition. Or misinformation of simply not knowing that there was a different way, of always being told by a religious leader, a pastor, or your parents that that's baptism. And you never studied it any deeper than that. And that's not necessarily a moral failure on your part. It's simply that you've been misinformed by it. Or maybe convenience, because it's just easier to be baptized in the way that you've always done it, or that your parents have always done it, or in a way that your church does it. It's just more convenient to do it that way. A good example of that, of course, is when churches schedule mass baptisms in advance, where they'll say, in six months from now, we're going to baptize anyone who needs to be baptized. We're going to have a big ceremony. It's going to be a big deal. There's going to be a potluck afterward. And anyone who wants to get baptized, we're going to schedule that date in advance. And it just becomes a matter of convenience rather than a matter of salvation. <laughs> Acts 22:16. Why do you delay? Arise and get baptized and have your sins washed away. Or even genuine belief that you truly do believe that whatever your traditional baptism is, that that is in fact biblical baptism. And you might genuinely believe that. But even genuine belief in something false doesn't make it true. In the same way that somebody might genuinely believe that the earth is flat, it doesn't make the earth flat. Genuinely believing something does not make it more true or more false. Sprinkling a baby with water is not the same thing as immersing a consenting, repentant adult. It's not the same thing. There's everything different about those things. A baby doesn't know what's going on to him or her. And sprinkling is not immersion. Sprinkling a baby is not the same thing as fully immersing a consenting, repentant adult. They're not the same thing. And to call both of them baptism is a misnomer. 
But the why, the why is so important. Go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. One of the great passages that if you keep, if you keep a set of passages handy and ready to go, just in case you have conversations, Acts 2 verse 30 is just one of those passages that you just have to have ready to go, locked and loaded. Brethren, what shall we do, they ask in verse 37, when presented, when presented with the enormity of their sin, their spiritual failure in the eyes of God, they say, well, what must we do? What's the situation? What's the answer to our enormous spiritual failure? And in verse 38, Peter says to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the forgiveness of sins. So if you want to know why we're baptized, Peter answers the question for you. Repent and be baptized. Why? Why repent and be baptized? What's the purpose behind it? What's the motive behind it? For the remission of your sins. Not because of the remission of your sins, not because you've already had them remitted, but the word eis in the Greek literally means unto, or in order to, or for. For the remission of your sins. In order to gain the remission of your sins. To have your sins washed away, you must be baptized. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, similarly connects the removal of sins with baptized. Arise and be baptized. Call on the name of the Lord and have your sins washed away. Go to Romans chapter 6 now, because there's a great, great point to make in Romans 6, especially in verse 4, that illustrates exactly what this whole eis, or this unto, this for, it illustrates exactly what we're talking about here. Go to Romans chapter 6, and let's begin in verse 1 for context, but I'm going to put some emphasis here on verse 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? Well, of course not. Grace is a wonderful thing, but that doesn't mean you take advantage of it, right? One thing to keep in mind about grace, I, I see grace as something that is inexhaustible. where it, It's a well of water that will, for all practical purposes, never be exhausted. That you could sin a thousand times, and if you're repentant, God will forgive you a thousand times, or a hundred thousand times, or a million times. It is an inexhaustible source of forgiveness. But just because it's inexhaustible doesn't mean that it doesn't have boundaries to it. A well might be practically inexhaustible where you can just get water out of it and water out of it. And in your lifetime, you might never see a well dry up. But it has boundaries, doesn't it? You can't be a hundred feet from a well and say, eh, eh. you can't get water out of a well if you're a hundred feet from it. You have to Go within the boundary of that well. That well has definite boundaries. It's a defined place. And you can't just look down at the water in the well and go, come up to me. You have to use the bucket to get the water out. So something might be inexhaustible, but that doesn't mean it's boundless. It has boundaries. It has limitations. And God's grace is the same way. It is inexhaustible. But it has boundaries. So he goes on to say in verse 2, May it never be, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Okay, that's a new conversation, dying to sin. Well, how do you die to sin? What, what's the process of dying to sin and becoming a new person? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Oh, we've got another element now, another piece of the puzzle. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. Now, the baptism is functional. It's functional. That's a great point to bring out, by the way, when you're talking to your religious friends about baptism. Baptism isn't just merely symbolic. Baptism isn't something you do after the fact, after you've been saved. Well, I believed in Jesus and led him into my heart, and then I'm going to get baptized later on as some kind of symbolic representation of a salvation that's already come. No, he says, we have been buried with him through baptism. You're not buried with Jesus in any other way but through baptism. Not after the fact, not later on, not symbolically. We are buried with Jesus through baptism in order that, look at that, in order that. Now that's not eis in the Greek. That's hina in the Greek. But it's a very similar word to eis. And hina in the Greek literally means in order that, or for the purpose of, or looking to an intended result. 
So it's, it's the same kind of language in Acts 2, verse 38, of repent and be baptized, aes, in order to, for the remission of sins. And here in Romans chapter 6, he's saying, in order that, and go ahead and skip the, the hypothetical here for just a second. Go ahead and skip that parenthetical statement. Because the whole verse reads, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Take that, take that parenthetical statement out there. In order that we too might walk in newness of life. That's what he's saying there. That as Christ was raised from the dead, we also get to walk in newness of life. How? How? How do we walk in newness of life? How are we raised up? We've been buried with Him through baptism into death in order that we too might walk in newness of life. In order to walk in newness of life. You don't walk in newness of life unless you've been baptized. And it is the baptism that puts the old man to death. And it is when we come out of the baptism that we're raised up with Christ to walk in newness of life. The newness of life does not happen until we've been baptized. It does not happen until we've been baptized. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. If all these things are not forceful enough, this, to me, this is the one that just drives it home, maybe more than any other passage in the New Testament. Here in Colossians chapter 2, and let's begin back in verse 9, just for context here. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete. How, how do you get in Him, by the way? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 points out that we've been buried into the body of Christ, right? Baptism puts us into the body of Christ. In Him. In Him is accomplished through baptism. And in Him, through your baptism, you've been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. And in Him... Through your baptism, because you don't get in Him unless you've been baptized into Him, and in Him you've been made complete. And He's the head over all rule and authority. Again, verse 11, And in Him you were also circumcised of the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God. Okay, what does the baptism do in Colossians 2 verse 12? having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with Him. You weren't raised up before baptism. You were raised up with Him in the baptism, in which, not after which, but in which you were raised up with Him. Now that doesn't mean the water's magical, but the why behind baptism has to mean something. The why has to mean something. Your attitude behind it, the purpose behind it, what you see is your baptism. Do you see baptism as merely some kind of symbolic obligation that you have to represent a salvation that already came? Well, then you're not being baptized in the way that Colossians 2.12 describes it, or Romans 6, or Acts 2, verse 38. Because all of those descriptions of baptism say that it is a functional, essential, necessary part of killing the old you and bringing to life the new you with Christ. You're buried with Him. You're raised up with Him. That's how the Bible describes the why between or, or in baptism. Baptism without faith is meaningless, just as baptism for the wrong reasons or under pretense also is meaningless. Otherwise, you believe the water's magical, right? Or you're just doing it for show. And I don't know which one is worse. We read of some people in Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus, verses 1 through 7 of Acts chapter 19. And Paul comes to Ephesus and he meets these people. And they're believers in Jesus, but they're not familiar with either the Holy Spirit or the baptism into Christ. He says, well, why were you baptized then? Or what kind of baptism was it? They said, well, we were baptized according to John the Baptist's baptism, which was merely a baptism of repentance that was not a salvific baptism. It had nothing to do with being baptized into Christ. It had nothing to do with becoming a Christian. It was a different kind of baptism under a different covenant, under different circumstances. It was not New Testament Christian baptism. 
But maybe they could have argued, yeah, but we were baptized. We went through the motions. So we did it for the wrong reasons. We had a misunderstanding. We were still technically baptized though, right? I mean, we got wet. I mean, that's the important thing, right? Is we got wet. And Paul confronts them about it because the why behind their baptism was off. The why behind their baptism was incorrect. They were not baptized for the salvation of their souls into Christ. And so they're rebaptized, and we use that term in a silly way, right? Rebaptized. If there is one baptism according to Ephesians chapter 4, then they weren't rebaptized. They were just baptized in the right way for the right reasons for the very first time. And notice here that they didn't resist that. They didn't argue against that. They didn't become petty about it. When they learned the truth of baptism, when they learned more information about why baptism is important, they didn't argue against that. And they didn't set up a time to debate and fuss about it. They simply said, well, if that's the way it is, we want to be saved. And that's all we care about. Not pride, not tradition, not preserving some kind of a facade or something. If that's what it means to be saved, then we want to be baptized in a way that saves us. And I admire them so very, very much. They understood 1 Peter 3, verse 21, that the water's not magical that it's not that you clean the flesh. That's not what's important. Baptism saves us, Peter writes. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a clean conscience. It's the inside part of you. It's just water. It's just water. Whether it's water in a baptistry that's got chlorine in it, or it's water in a brook, or water anywhere else in the world in a horse trough. It's just water. But why you get baptized, that means something. Wherever the water is, in what condition the water is, warm or cold, filthy or clean, it's just water. But Peter says that water, when you are baptized into it for the right reasons, as an appeal to God for a clean conscience, that baptism means something. And the last point I'll make is this. There is a time element to it. The how, the why, and the when of baptism. Not when you're a baby or a small child. Jesus said that we need to be converted and become like small children, so it would make no sense to me. It would make no sense to me that Jesus the Lord would say, when you're converted as a Christian, you need to be converted and become like a little child who, according to some denominations and human traditions, is just as sinful as anybody else. If children have sins that need to be repented of, if they have sins that need to be washed away, then why would Jesus say, convert from a state of sinfulness to a state of equal sinfulness? No, children don't have sin. That's why they don't get baptized, at least biblically speaking. If someone doesn't have sin, they don't need to be baptized. Babies don't need to be baptized. Little children don't need to be baptized. They don't have sins that need to be washed away. So that time element there of your baptism, and if you were baptized as a little child or as a baby, it's time to rethink that because you had no choice in the matter. You had no why in the matter. There was no motive behind that except to simply be a complicit little being in something that's done to you by somebody else. But there's also an element of avoiding delay. If you shouldn't be baptized as a little baby because you don't have sins to be washed away, then you need to be really careful then as you go through life, as you become an adult and get older and middle-aged and even as an elderly person, don't put it off. Don't delay. And that's exactly what Paul was told to do. Arise and be baptized. Why do you delay, Saul of Tarsus? Don't delay any longer. Because you can't put it off for a more convenient time that more convenient time might not come for you. Next Sunday might not roll around. Tomorrow might not roll around. Five minutes from now might never even come for you. I was like the way Paul put it in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So he says to the Corinthians here, beginning in verse 1, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I suppose that's as applicable to this lesson on baptism as anything else, right? Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Don't go through the motions of baptism just because you feel like you have to. 
And don't go, don't go through the motions of baptism thinking that you've just tied everything up if you don't have the right reason behind it, or if it was vain, or if it was empty, or if it was just for show. He says in verse 2, for he says, quoting here from Isaiah 49, at the acceptable time I listened to you on the day of salvation, I helped you, and here's what Paul says by way of commentary. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, right now. Because that more convenient time might never come. There will be no last minute baptisms when the judgment day comes. When we hear the trumpets in the sky and the glory of the Lord descending upon this earth in judgment, there is no such thing as a last minute baptism. Every appeal to God at that point is pointless because we've reached that point of no return. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus speaks of the people on the judgment day. They'll be saying, Lord, Lord, did we not? Lord, Lord, we did a lot of things for you and we thought we were doing everything right. And he'll say, depart from me because you're a worker of lawlessness. You didn't do what I asked you to do. And what a sad day that is going to be for so many because they did something out of human tradition or they did something as obligation to a religion or a denomination, to their parents, their grandparents, or they simply did something because they were misinformed and didn't put the energy or the effort into digging a little bit deeper in their Bible study. And that's going to be a very sad day. And I hope that it will not be a sad day for any one of us here, presenting the simple truth of the Bible, that you must believe and be baptized in order to be saved. So if you have any spiritual needs at all right now, please let those needs be known. Please come forward as we stand and sing.